Welcome to the Catholic Culture Podcast, dedicated to the Holy Family. I'm Thomas V. Miras. Today I'm speaking with John McQuillan and Holly Ordway about a new exhibition of J.R.R. Tolkien's artworks, manuscripts, and personal items. While Tolkien's brilliance as a world builder and storyteller is well established, fewer people are aware of just how unique and obsessive his creative process was, or that he was a gifted visual artist. That is changing thanks to an unprecedented exhibition of Tolkien's personal items, manuscripts, and artworks. Tolkien, maker of Middle Earth. It's currently on display at the Morgan Library in Manhattan. Today I'm talking to John McQuillan, assistant curator of printed books at the Morgan Library, and Holly Ordway, author of the upcoming study, Tolkien's Modern Sources. We'll be discussing this amazing exhibition, which sheds light on Tolkien's use of visual art to help him solidify his literary vision, the role his stories and artworks played in his family life, and perhaps surprisingly to many who view Tolkien as a conservative fuddy-duddy and nothing else, his willingness to draw on an eclectic range of sources, including distinctly modern ones, to enhance his creative expression. It's worth noting that the reason I ended up interviewing these two together is because they had just done an event at the Sheen Center for Thought and Culture, which is run by the Archdiocese of New York. That event was actually moderated by one of my previous guests on this podcast, Corey Olson, the Tolkien professor. I'll link to his episodes at the show notes page, catholicculture.org slash episode 30. It's also worth mentioning that although, if you're as big a Tolkien fan as I am, it's definitely worth driving a few hours to see this exhibit in Manhattan. The exhibit book, which has even more materials than the actual exhibit in the Morgan Library does, uh, is available on Amazon for about 30 bucks. I've visited the exhibit three times now, and I have the book as well, so definitely worth checking that out if you live too far away. John and Holly, welcome to the Catholic Culture Podcast. Well, thank you for having us on. Thank you, Thomas. So, John, as the curator of this exhibit at the Morgan, maybe you can tell us about something about the origins of this show, where the pieces actually come from, and give us sort of an overview of the content. Of course. The exhibition, Tolkien, Maker of Middle-Earth, was created by the Tolkien archivist, Catherine McElwain, at the Bodleian Library at the University of Oxford where this exhibition was on show the summer of 2018. The exhibition is largely drawn from the material in the Tolkien archive at the Bodleian, which is over 500 boxes and 300 volumes of material from Tolkien's personal library, his manuscript notes, illustrations, maps related to the breadth of the creation of Middle Earth, as well as personal objects, academic papers, calendars, family archive. It is a vast and wide-ranging archive. She did a, a titanic job of culling through this material to create a coherent narrative that both covers Tolkien's life and his more popular uh, literary output that we are familiar with. And so an exhibition that covers both who he was as a son, as a husband, father, academic, author, soldier, devout Catholic, and the creative process behind the production of The Silmarillion, The Hobbit, and The Lord of the Rings. The Morgan exhibition is a slightly distilled version of the Bodleian exhibition. Uh, We have about 115 objects that cover the same themes as the Bodleian exhibition in the catalog, a biographical sketch of Tolkien, a little bit on his childhood, his student days, his family life, the relationship he had with his children, as well as his own artistic background, his creative process in the depiction of the visual world of Middle-earth writ large, the early illustrations through to the more finished drawings for The Hobbit, The Lord of the Rings, and The Silmarillion. So in the exhibition, you get a sense of, a little bit better sense of who Tolkien was as an individual and his creative process in both the writing and drawing of Middle-earth. So I'm aware that 
some of Tolkien's materials are at Marquette University. Is there a difference in the type of materials that they have at the Bodleian versus those at Mar- Marquette? Yes, I think a lot of your listeners and viewers to the exhibition will be surprised to find out that the manuscripts for The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings actually reside in America. They are at Marquette University Library. In 1956, the librarian at Marquette, William Reedy, uh, wanted to start building a collection of Catholic authors' papers. And he wrote to Tolkien and requested, if, if Tolkien were interested, that they would be interested in purchasing his handwritten manuscripts for these two works. Tolkien uh, was very excited that someone would be willing and, and thought it worthy to collect his material. And so he willingly uh, sold them for 1,500 pounds to Marquette. They have been the uh, focus of exhibitions at Marquette. And there is, uh, much like at the Bodleian, there is a Tolkien curator, an archivist at Marquette, who helps sort of organize a little bit of the material for this show and pull out of the almost 10,000 sheets, pieces of paper in the Marquette archive to, again, distill that down to the, the, the highlight pieces that can really help show the narrative and show you something about Tolkien's process. So the archive at the Bodleian, or I should say the the exhibit at the Bodleian and here, have there been any, any exhibits like that in the past or in the recent past? Of Tolkien material? There have yeah. been a few. And over the years at, at Marquette, at Wheaton College in Illinois, there have been smaller exhibitions of Tolkien material. And individually, a few pieces, Tolkien's watercolors for The Hobbit, the dust jacket for The Hobbit, have, have appeared in in various literary exhibitions put on both here in America and in Britain. But this is really the first chance to see the uh, single large collection all in one place of so much of his original authorial material uh, most of the exhibition material is in Tolkien's own hand, rather uh, textual or visual. And it really is a a unique opportunity to see so much material in one place. Usually Marquette and the Bodleian have on display at any one time one single item out of the whole archive. And so this really is a unique opportunity to see so much in one place and really understand the connections between the different works. Can you give my listeners an idea of what kind of items related to Tolkien's personal life they might find at the exhibit? It's fascinating to see some of the early photographs from his childhood. He was born in 1892 in Bloemfontein in the Orange Free State in what is now the Republic of South Africa. And in his first year, we have a photograph that was taken of his family, his mother, his father, and even their household servants that his mother has very annotated, very detailed with a Christmas wish to friends and family back in England and drawn a little landscape of the South African landscape. So you get to see something from the very beginning, uh, the depiction of the family, but also his mother's interest and ability in sort of script and writing and this sort of visual decoration, which of course plays a very significant role for Tolkien later in his life. There are family photographs of Tolkien and his brother Hillary throughout their childhood and some a little watercolor that Tolkien produced when he was 10 of a tree and a stream and sort of a green verdant landscape, the English countryside. Again, illustrating for a very young Tolkien this, this interest in the natural setting in the landscape, in trees, as a beautiful uh, creation unto themselves. And this, again, plays a significant role in his literary life. So, Holly, can you talk about the influence that Tolkien's mother had on him, uh, both as an artist and as a Catholic? Those first 10 to 12 years of his life were very formative in that regard. Oh, absolutely. They were extremely significant for him. I mean, as, uh, as John's already said, you know, artistically, uh, Mabel influenced him in giving both an example and actual instruction in calligraphy and obviously encouraged him in his art. But one of the, the most significant ways in which she influenced him was by her Catholic conversion. Because she, um, you know, she became a Catholic. She was an Anglican uh, when she married her husband and uh, Tolkien was baptized as an Anglican in the uh, cathedral um, in Bloemfontein. And so when she decided to become a Catholic, this was a really momentous decision 
and her family did not approve and indeed cut her off. And this led to the, you know, the young family's poverty. And that for Tolkien would have been you know, you know, within his childhood memory. As he was, he was 12 when, uh, when she died. Uh, he was 10 when he was received as a Catholic, uh, had his first Holy Communion. And so this is certainly within, at an age that he would have, have noticed, have observed, have retained it. And so seeing that witness where she stuck with her Catholic faith, even though it would have been so much more you know, comfortable and easy for her to say, well, no, and to walk back from it. And that, that was a significant influence. And one that really he, he referred back to later in his life, it was a, a significant thing for him, the sacrifice that she was willing to make, including, you know, arguably her life, because she died of complications from diabetes, which wasn't very treatable at the time. This is pre-insulin. But had they had more money, she would have been able to receive better care and, and might have lived at least longer. So I, I think this was a, a very formative thing for him um, at an early age. My understanding is that she also encouraged him in his study of language. I think Greek and Latin, she helped to teach him as a child. There's also a story that Tolkien tells about his first memory of writing a story, I'm sure you're familiar with this, where he had written a story about a green great dragon and his mother corrected him and said, you know, it's it's not green great dragon, it's great green dragon. And he said, you know, that question of why that would be, the, why the latter would be correct and the former incorrect has fascin fascinated me for, for my whole life. Yes, yeah, so we see both his early interest in language and the way that she encouraged him in that. And so you can see his interest in language coming very, very early on because most, I think it's fair to say most children, when they're corrected to say, okay, the, the great green dragon, will just take it in stride and say, okay, well, that was maybe a little bit weird, but okay. But Tolkien starts thinking, well, why? And that question of the why of language really is at the heart of his philological studies. You know, why does our language take the form that it takes now? Where did it come from? What shaped it? And, you know, and, and he ended up becoming literally a world-class expert in his field of philology. Uh, I mean, Tolkien's genius is just tremendous. He's, he's, he's world-class in so many different areas. It's astounding. But linguistically, he certainly was as well. And we can trace that you know, far back. And, and indeed, we can trace his mother's hand in encouraging him. So one of my favorite items in the exhibit, and I was blown away uh, that this still exists, is I'd read about this... Um, you know, when his father died, he was four. His family had been in South Africa. His father was working at a bank. They had uh, he and his mother and his brother Hillary had come back to uh, England. I think the father was planning on joining them at a, a later time. I don't know if they were moving back there permanently or or what. But basically, he was writing a letter to his father at age four with the help of of his nurse, and uh, she was obviously writing it. But and uh, later that day, they got a telegram saying that his father was very ill, and the next day his father died. So the letter was never sent. But you know, it's a moving story. And then I come to the exhibit, and I saw this, and it was like, wow, I, I can't believe that that somebody saved that. And that's I, like I almost cried when I saw that because I, you know, I'd read this story and I, I didn't expect to be confronted with this this artifact from you know such a, a tragic time in Tolkien's life. So that was pretty amazing. And I think it does um, bring up something which is really important in understanding Tolkien's life, which is that he experienced quite a lot of suffering and loss throughout his whole life. You know, he lost his father at age four. He lost his mother at age twelve. You know, he served in the front lines, in the trenches, literally in trenches in um, World War I, where most of his close friends were killed. He got trench fever. He suffered chronic illness throughout his life, in part, I, I think, from the lingering effects of the trench fever. And, you know, and he had financial worries. He and Edith raised four children and sent them all to Oxford University, all four of them, including his daughter. And, you know, he had he was marking examination papers in his summers. Um, and as a professor myself, I can tell you that's not what you want to be doing in your summers because he needed the extra money to pay for the expenses of his growing family. Not to mention air raid duties during the Second World War. Exactly. Yeah, he lives through two world wars and then to have two of his sons um, serving in the war. And Christopher was a pilot, which was one of the most high risk occupations that you could have in the war. So he's serving as an air raid captain. His sons, you know, his sons are fighting. He doesn't know, you know, is Christopher going to be shot down? So he really has a lot of suffering that he experiences throughout his life. And yet he never becomes bitter. 
he never turns inward and 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 bruise you know stews on it he has this source of joy and he recognizes suffering he doesn't gloss over it and i think this is one of the reasons that the lord of the rings and indeed all of his work but i think especially the lord of the rings is one of the elements that makes it so powerful because he doesn't just tell a story in which everything is fine and happy there's real suffering real brokenness and sometimes people who i think haven't read the book very carefully think oh all the you know Nobody suffers as the good characters, you know, they all ha- live happily ever after. And th- that's simply not the case. Because we, for instance, we see most poignantly Frodo, who saves the Shire, but not for himself. He's he's so wounded that he cannot, he cannot enjoy it. He can't have the, the enjoyment of the thing that he, you know, was broken to save. So I, I think all of that really helps explain the some of the depth of The Lord of the Rings. Uh, and I do think that Tolkien's um, the depth of his Catholic faith was really instrumental in transforming his suffering into joy and not having it be something that that burdened him. Yeah, you can't read the Silmarillion and come away with that impression either. I mean, it's much darker and gloomier uh, than even the the darkest parts of the Lord of the Rings, like the ter- the Tale of Turin, for example, is like you know basically like makes me think of Oedipus. <laughs> it's it's like that. So, oh, John, by the way, feel free to chime in whenever you want, because I don't always know what you'll be able to comment on. I was just going to say that I think that's what one of the things that sort of an exhibition like this brings to the fore is the person behind the story. Many people, you know, know Tolkien because they've read The Hobbit, The Lord of the Rings, The Silmarillion. But looking at the actual material, the the letter from when he was four years old, uh, written the day before his father died, a book that he worked on with his wife, Edith, photographs of their children. These are not reproductions of material. These are the actual family items. These are Tolkien's personal items. This is, you know, selections of his manuscript draft for The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings. When his ideas change, when he has when he decides that Bladderthin the wizard is not necessarily a good name and his name should be Gandalf the Grey. You know, you have these moments, you're you're in Tolkien's study with him, with the family, looking on over his shoulder while he's working on this. And so in that respect, the show is about, you know, the greater the greater world of Middle Earth, but it still is about Tolkien and the actual material of his life. Perhaps you could tell us about some of the items that are related to Tolkien's family life, uh, not just the ones directly bearing on it, but particularly the ones that show, starting with the book Book of Ishness, how his artistic life cooperated with his family life. From an early age, as we have said, uh, Mabel had encouraged her son's artistic talents and early, quote unquote, childish watercolors. By the time he is a teenager, uh, an undergrad at Oxford, he has this watercolor sketchbook that he titles The Book of Ishness. And it's a collection of abstract ideas, visualized abstract thoughts, real landscapes, fantasy landscapes, abstract patterns that that try and achieve a, a sort of visualization of the reality that was in his head. There are scenes that are quite real, like a a depiction of um, what he titles eeriness, which is sort of a forest path with very eerie, sinister trees creeping over the path and a lone figure in a cloak with a walking staff walking into this forest. This is 20 years before he ever thought of The Hobbit and Gandalf. But you have this sort of image in his imagination that is so strong that it's coming out in his teen teen years in illustration. And again, we'll come back again in The Hobbit. His artistic practice was something that was so endemic to his, his life, whether it was sketching on Holiday in Cornwall or these sort of hobby illustrations of, of images in his head, he carried into his family life and as a very devoted father would make uh, drawings of the little animals that were terrifying his son Michael's dreams and fantastic illustrations of this uh, this scary owl, Owlamoo, 
that Michael was scared of. And Tolkien took his son's fears incredibly seriously and produced little drawings of the owl so Michael could see it and not be afraid. It became more real and something that wasn't terrifying. And for 25 years, from 1920, every year Tolkien produced the Father Christmas letters for his children. Every year they received a letter from Father Christmas and an illustration detailing something about Father Christmas's life at the North Pole that year. Tolkien worked on these and then would hand them off to the mailman so then he would deliver them from Father Christmas. It's an incredibly creative and devoted father who would go through this effort to bring joy into his children's lives and excitement. By the time they would be around the age of 13, the they would be let in on the ruse and help to carry it forward for the younger their younger siblings. And it's an amazing and beautiful moment in his family when a father who is besought with academic work, financial cares, illness, his own literary desires, takes the time to stop and produce these incredibly creative and beautiful letters just for his children's joy. Those early watercolors of Tolkien's are so different from his later work, and they're often quite trippy. Do we have any sense of, of where that was coming from or what influences he may have had? I mean, they, they're much more sort of avant-garde than you might expect from someone who's known as kind of a stodgy traditionalist. Indeed. I think a lot of people will be surprised to see how how modern they are in their color combinations, in the abstract design. You know, Tolkien as modernist is not really, is a, is a topic that is soon to be covered. But I think it shows, you know, someone who was very much of his day. He was not an antiquated uh, thinker or dreamer. He very much lived in his time. Later on in some of the the Hobbit illustrations, you see clear references to sort of, you know, Art Nouveau, uh, Tiffany-esque patterns, but not direct quotations necessarily. He's not, his journal patterns, there are elements that he draws from published sources. The, the great eagle illustration in The Hobbit. The eagle is taken directly from a natural history book and an illustration of an eagle in that. But then other elements, he kind of cobbles together from his own interest in patterns, in design. Plant forms. Plant, very indeed. Plant forms. He was, he was a, I think, if not an English philologist, he would have been a botanist. He was so interested in the natural world. And I think this ties in really, really closely to the research that I've been doing over the last few years and for the book that will be coming out soon um, in the next year called Tolkien's Modern Sources, where I'm looking at his modern reading. And by modern, I, I picked the cutoff date of 1850, you know, modern for Tolkien. And that's about the time the modern novel, you know, starts up. And when I started working in this research project uh, about, about seven years ago now, I really was interested to see what he would be reading of modern literature because I just had a, a sort of sense that, you know, the Lord of the Rings is is different. The Lord of the Rings is not just medieval pastiche. It's something special. Where did it come from? And I had read enough um, in my earlier scholarship of early fantasy to know that he was relating to some of the earlier fantasists like William Morris, Lord Dunsany, Eyre Edison. But I wanted to know, well, did he read anything else? And interestingly... The general critical you know, idea, and certainly the general popular idea, has been, oh, no, he didn't care about modern literature. And that really can be traced pretty directly to his first biographer, Humphrey Carpenter, who wrote in the biography that Tolkien took no notice of modern literature, that he didn't read it and didn't take any note of it. And he just throws out one name, John Buchan, um, as an exception. And because Carpenter is an important biographer. He's so far the only one who has had access to the to the Tolkien papers, you know, completely. He is a very important source, but Carpenter also kind of had a chip on his shoulder about Tolkien. thought thought he was a fuddy duddy before he even started working on the biography. And I have come to realize that Carpenter's statement that he took no notice of modern literature is simply factually incorrect. He read a great deal. He I kept turning up 
you know, name after name of author that he read in his draft manuscripts, um, in his published writings, in his interviews, in his letters, um, in interviews with family and friends where they would mention books that he had read or that he'd recommended to them, you know, scores of them. And across a huge range of genre and style, from modern literary fiction to science fiction to contemporary poetry, you know, he really read very, very widely and took an interest in it. And this, I think, is sort of supported by what we were just saying about the art, because once you start realizing that he was a man who really was engaged with modernity, with modern culture, you start to see, oh, well, you can see it in his paintings. He's not rejecting Art Deco or Art Nouveau styles. He's saying, oh, well, let me see what I can do with them. And I think what we see in The Lord of the Rings and in all of his published writings, and I think in his, in his art, we see it as well, is he knows what he wants to achieve. He's drawing very heavily on medieval sources. Absolutely no denying that. That's probably the most significant source for his work. And he's drawing very heavily on his linguistic inspirations. Absolutely. So the linguistic, the languages, the medieval sources are hugely important, but he's drawing on those and framing them with a, with a sort of modern lens. He's also drawing on these, these modern works and it's shaping the themes. It's contributing specific images, specific ideas, even specific points in some of the stories. And I think this helps us to understand better just how powerful the Lord of the Rings is. Because if it was only a backward-looking medieval nostalgia piece, why would so many people find it so powerful and so compelling in you know the 21st century? And I think part of the answer, in, in addition to the fact that it's just a ripping good story, is that he really is engaging with the modern world and with modern themes because he understood these these issues and these themes and was using, in in many cases, modern um, stylistic devices, meta narrative, um, things like that, very sophisticated things and incorporating them in. And he got those from his wider modern reading. Yeah. Tom Chippy in his, his scholarly works on Tolkien talks about how Tolkien was a distinctively modern author. And it's interesting, you know, we could say that as a Catholic and for various other reasons just related to his personal disposition, he could read medieval works with more of a more of an ability perhaps to see the world through those eyes than other moderns would be able to. And yet he also looks back on them through the lens of history, through the lens of cultural history and the history of language. And philology is just not something that existed in the Middle Ages. So if you're looking at medieval language and stories as a philologist, it doesn't mean that you're you're imposing a modern point of view on them exactly. I mean, you, you have to be careful about that as a scholar. But if then if you're using all that to create a story of your own, it's just going to look different. And as you said, for example, the meta narrative, the fact that he within his stories, or at least in the appendices, appendices of Lord of the Rings, he, there's like a textual criticism of the you know, the provenance of the, the Red Book, which becomes translated, you know, by its modern modern author. And, you know, it turns out that Sam Samwise's name is really like Kazuhir or something because he translated the names of the ho- the hobbits into English sounding names to make them more relatable to modern readers. So there's all these things that, you know, and also the fact that he's trying to do at least in his early ambitions, I don't know if he was thinking of it in this way throughout his whole life, his early ambitions were to create a mythology for England. So he's trying to do the work of an entire culture as one man. Not only that, but he's looking, maybe getting ahead of myself here, but it's fascinating to me in the exhibit, you know, I knew about how obsessed he was with this world he had created uh, starting in his teens, practically to the end of his life. But the fact that he was also doing so many things that were never intended to, for publication, you know, coming up with sort of devices and, and symbols for various characters, drawing plant forms that would really have no way of ever making it into a book, you know, f- coming up with what some, some Numenorean flower would look like, things like that. He's trying to do the work of – because I remember in, uh, in his early years, he was thinking about – I, you know, I would love for people to create this mythology and then have other people do things with it. I would love to, you know, people in, in my wildest dreams, you know, people would be writing operas based on it, you know, similar to 
with Norse mythology or, you know, Greek mythology or whatever, things like that. So it's fascinating. But obviously, that is a distinctively modern point of view because he's able to look back on how cultures develop, on how myths are told and retold, and incorporate that all into a single body of work. And it's also interesting because that happened. You know, because he kept returning to these stories, they kept evolving. The final version we have of the Silmarillion is not the final version of the Silmarillion. It's just what we have, you know, at the time of his death and Christopher, his son Christopher decided, made editorial choices about what versions of the stories to include and what not. So, you know, he, he really is a totally unique artist, not just in the content of what he made, but in his process. I mean, there's there's so many different uh, aspects of that we could we could discuss. But I, I was going to ask you, do you have a sense of, you know, I'm, I'm aware he was reading people like Asimov and I forget there's a, I'm blanking on her name, but I was reading his letters last year and he mentioned an author who was writing novel as a, yes, Mary Renault. Yes. Because I bought one of her, I read about her and then I bought one of her books for my mom for her birthday and she really liked it. I haven't read her yet, but I'm, I'm going to eventually, I think it's The King Must Die or something like that. Uh, based on what what is it, uh, Perseus, Theseus? I always get this Theseus. Yes. Anyway, do you have a sense of what like sort of properly speaking modernist authors he might have read and enjoyed? I'm um, thinking the modernist you're yes, saying. Exactly. Um, well, we know, for instance, that he read or was at least familiar with James Joyce because he he makes a note of um, the name Anna Olivia Pluribel from Finnegans Wake um, appears in some of his his manuscript notes. And Joyce's interest in language is something that would have been very intriguing to Tolkien. Um, similarly, he makes refuge, uh, reference to Gertrude Stein in his notes to A Secret Vice, his, his lecture on language. So he's interested in these poets. He's also reading some more modern poets. For instance, he hugely admired the modern poet Roy Campbell. And Campbell's interesting because you know, he's a Catholic poet. And you would think, oh, well, you know, maybe that's just why Tolkien liked him. But really, his if you look at the the volumes of poetry that Tolkien specifically praised, um, one is Flowering Rifle, which is about the Civil War in Spain. Um, one is Flaming Terrapin. And that last one is quite interesting because it's basically a, a, a retelling of the story of the flood in a sort of surreal way. And you end up having it shift into a sort of prophetic critique of modern culture. And it's really biting. Um, it's, it's satiric. It's, it's very almost aggressive in its, its denunciation of, of uh, modern culture, including clericalism. I mean, he's just unsparing. He's just laying it out in, in this sort of surreal way. And it's, let's just say that it's not the sort of thing that you would think that Tolkien would admire if you think of him as being a stodgy medievalist. It's very modern. It's very abrasive. It's very gory at times. It's not what you would, would think. So that's the sort of thing that he was interested in these in these things. Or as another example, um, we don't know any more about what he thought about it, but he stayed up um, late one night reading a book called Picnic at Saqqara, which is and he writes to the author, William Reddy, that he enjoyed it. He was staying up late reading it. And you might think, well, what's this book about? Well, it turns out that it's a satiric novel about a hapless English lecturer who has a teaching um, post in Egypt during student riots and gets caught up in the um, political machinations of the students during these riots. And again, would this come to mind as a book that Tolkien would even read, let alone that he would enjoy so much he would stay up late reading it and tell the you know the, the author that he that he did? It, it really shakes our image of Tolkien and makes us realize that he really was interested in different kinds of stories, including ones that we might call very modernist. Right. I think it's fair to say he probably wasn't a fan of like social realism. For example, but or is it not well, fair to say that? Interestingly, um, he says that he read all of the books by Sinclair Lewis. Oh, really? Who is a yeah? He all I've read all of them, and he specifically mentions Babbitt as as p maybe potentially contributing some of the sound of of Hobbit. Oh, yes, I remember that. But it, people remember that, but they sort of skim over the fact that he says, "Oh, I've read all of Sinclair Lewis." Right. And Sinclair okay. Lewis is a American social realist author. He's, you know, Main Street, Elmer Gantry, it's straight up social realist, you know, social critique. And Tolkien not only read just one, but he kept reading them. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. There's a passage in one of his letters where he's talking about someone who gave him a really nasty review. And he says something like, 
you know, it's okay because I despise the type of literature these people admire as well. So what would he have been referring to there? Is, the, is, it, a, is it a matter of style and genre or is it more a matter, matter of their, their moral worldview that he would have been referring to? Well, that's a very interesting question because it's not just a matter of the moral view. Because, for instance, he says in one of his letters that he read everything that E.R. Edison wrote, although he considered his Edison's philosophy to be vile, corrupting, and evil. He definitely objects because Edison was a, a sort of a, a very strange pantheist, and Edison it really was very dismissive of evil, thought it wasn't a problem. Interestingly, um, although Tolkien was on the front lines in the Great War, Edison served in an office during the war. So I, I, I think that Edison was able to be a little bit more blasé about the problem of evil, and Tolkien took it seriously. But he says that despite Edison's evil and corrupting philosophy, he greatly admires his craft and writing, considers him to be one of the best world builders and read everything that he wrote. And I think, and this, there are several different examples of this in his reading, that he's able to admire the writing of someone who differs morally from him, not just philosophically on a few points, but really diametrically uh, differs from him. So he's able to respect the writing of someone even while not endorsing their philosophy. Now, I think what he, I mean, he doesn't approve of it, but he's able to appreciate the, those aspects of it that are, that are worthwhile. And I think the sorts of things that he didn't like um, were things that were ugly or drab. Like he he calls um, William Golding's The Lord of the Flies dreary stuff. And he just didn't have any time for that. Uh, he, he wanted something that was engaging. Um, he wanted, and I think he, he felt very strongly of the importance of narrative and the importance of having a good story to tell. And and he wanted to, he wanted it to be fun. He wanted it to be engaging, and I think that's where you know, for instance, the the, the adjective dreary <laughs> comes in with uh, with Golding. He just didn't think that it that it had that compelling aspect. C.S. Lewis, Tolkien's friend, was not really a fan of T.S. Eliot's poetry. Was Tolkien into Eliot? He doesn't seem to have liked Eliot's work, but he he had read it. He was familiar with it. He didn't go so far as to you know do any of the. Uh, the denunciations or, or, um, or you know, desire to play pranks on uh, on Eliot that uh, that Lewis did. And um, we don't know any more about what Tolkien thought of Eliot, but I do think that given Tolkien's appreciation of poets like Roy Campbell, for instance, or Elizabeth Jennings, he and or W. H. Auden, all of whose poetry he appreciated, I'm my guess would be, and this would be a speculation, my guess would be that he was probably somewhat more sympathetic to Eliot's um, project than Lewis was. Interesting. Well, Lewis was kind of a more of a polemicist, maybe, in that sense. So, yeah, it's it's very interesting to think about Tolkien's open-mindedness um, in terms of literature, because it's paradoxical, and it, I mean, it reveals something about the nature of the artist, I think, because Tolkien you know, among artists who are known to be sort of committed to their own point of view, Tolkien basically knew what his liter literary tastes were from a young age. And he had a specific vision that he stuck to. And it's even more pronounced because it was all, most of his work was occurring within a specific world that he created. So he was incredibly committed to this, to this, this overarching literary project. And yet he's willing to draw from all these other sources. And you can see that in the visual works as well. I remember, so last year I decided to invest in some nice editions of Tolkien's main works. So I got, uh, I think it was like a 50th anniversary or 60th anniversary HarperCollins publication of The Lord of the Rings with his original cover art. And there was also, I got a, a, an edition of the Silmarillion with his painting of, um, I forget the name of the mountain, but it's in the exhibit, yeah, Tenequetil, where he, where it's got this, this holy mountain of the gods, the Valar, and it's like going up into space, essentially, uh, like through the atmosphere. Anyway, I also picked up a copy of The Hobbit with his original cover art for that, and it also has all the the color plates inside. So in one of the pictures, I forget which one, I picked up on, and this might just be my imagination, I picked up on what looked kind of reminded me of Asian landscape art, like some of the, I think it was some of the cliff sides or something just reminded me of a Chinese or Japanese 
uh, painting I had seen. And so then when I was in this exhibit, it was cool to see uh, one of his later, I I forget when it was from, it might have been when he was older, he was messing around and drawing bamboo with black ink in the exhibit, uh, the plaque mentioned that that's a feature of Chinese and, and Japanese traditional art. So it's really interesting to see different styles he, he he draws on. So as a curator, would you be able to, even if you don't know, we don't know factually what his influence might have been, is there a sense that you have of what some of his, his artistic influences might have been, what the sort different sort of styles he was exper- experimenting with? I mean, can you go into more detail in, in terms of Art Deco and things like that, what those are? Yeah, you do get ideas when you look at his choices of illustration. And much like in terms of the text and the literary side, where he is pulling the elements he needs from existing world literature to create his vision, he's pulling the visual elements he needs from world visual culture to create his vision. So the easy ones, comparatively easy, I think it's it's understandable in the watercolors to The Hobbit. It's 1937. There are foliate and graphic elements that are very reminiscent, again, of sort of that sort of swirly foliate Art Nouveau style, the the work of Lewis Comfort Tiffany, a little bit kind of like the work of William Morris and the Kelmscott Press and his arts and crafts movement. Those sorts of foliate and floral patterns were something that Tolkien was particularly drawn to. And I think they particularly for him represented the his vision of aspects of Middle Earth. Throughout his life, I mean, there are, are so many sketches, illustrations, watercolors that have sort of elements and reflections of world art that you can see. The illustrations from later in life are, he did a, a large series that are just black ink on white paper that tend to be Uh, depictions of grasses, plants, sort of elements that he labels in Elvish with titles that visually are reminiscent of the traditional arts of China and Japan, the black ink, uh, bamboo drawings, screen drawings that he, he likely became familiar with through either works in the Bodleian Library itself. They have an extensive, extensive collection of manuscript material, uh, drawings, works on paper from Asia, China, Japan, India, Southeast Asia. This would have been material that he might have seen through the 1940s, 50s, 60s on exhibition as we are now looking at his material. It was part of his greater visual world in Oxford. And in fact, there is, uh, for his watercolor of Bilbo coming to the huts of the raft elves from The Hobbit, which is a his favorite illustration of The Hobbit, actually, and shows Bilbo riding on a barrel down the river, coming out from under the shade and cool of the trees into a little bit uh, open air and open water. The trees sort of have these very gnarly roots that cling down around the riverbanks. And there are actually a series of Japanese woodcuts and paintings that have very similar illustrative principles of a, of a, you know, trees that sort of look a bit like that. Whether this was something that he was directly looking at and, and inspired him, or much like with, again, his literary composition practice, where where you take the elements you need from world literature and recombine them to create your vision, you know, that, that element of sort of the gnarled, like clutching tree root over bare rock was a certain visual element that really jived with his vision of middle earth. And this is the look of a very ancient, a forest where the roots are exposed. It has been there so long that the tree is still clutching to the rock. And it gives a little bit of a hint of the longevity and the depth of Middle Earth in this little visual notion. But for him, it was a clear parallel as to what, what would best represent 
his vision of Middle Earth. And I think that, again, it really shows his the, the freshness of his vision, because we have to kind of look objectively at the art and see, as you've just noted, John, that, you know, it does have these these Japanese and more art deco um, styles. And once you realize that, you look at those paintings, and you see, oh, yeah, you see that. And I think it can be helpful to contrast that with the art of Pauline Baines, who did um, the art for Farmer Giles of Ham. And Tolkien was very pleased with her art, but her designs are very much a medieval-esque style. Um, they're very, very very reminiscent of medieval manuscript drawings, even in the way that, you know, she she frames the pictures. And if Tolkien had wanted to, he could have done the art for The Hobbit, The Lord of the Rings in that kind of style, or he could have said, oh, let's have Pauline Baines do these illustrations. And it would have had a much more medieval feel to it. And but he didn't. He didn't choose to do that. He chose to do it for his medieval pastiche, because Farmer Giles is, is a comic piece. But he didn't do it for his serious work. Interestingly, the Baines connection is fun to consider, because Tolkien was very pleased with her. So he liked he liked her art. Um, he didn't have it for The Hobbit or Lord of the Rings, but he liked it for Farmer Giles. And in fact, he recommended her to C.S. Lewis to do the illustrations for the Narnia books. And I wanted to sort of put my oar in here um, to kind of clarify a point. It, Tolkien's objection to the Narnia books is is, is really overblown um, in people's minds. People will say things like, oh, Tolkien hated Narnia. No, he didn't. He didn't enjoy what he heard of it. And we don't even know that, that he read all of them. We know that he heard at least part of the um, line in which the wardrobe in an Inklings meeting, but he may not have read any, read any of it as a complete manuscript. He may not have heard more than that. He didn't like the way that Lewis sort of mixed up his mythologies. Um, he had certain objections to that, the way that Lewis handled it. And he, he goes on to say at one point that these books are outside the range of his imaginative sympathy. But he didn't say that they were bad. They were outside the range of his imaginative sympathy. But he obviously supported the overall project. I think he was a little bit maybe irked or sort of put off by the apparent ease by which Lewis produced the books. Now, Lewis, I think, did much more of his composition internally before putting it on paper. He didn't do as much revising on paper as, as Tolkien did. So I think for Tolkien, it could have seemed that it was a bit too quick. It wasn't, but Lewis had a different compositional process than, than Tolkien did. But if he had really hated the Narnia books, would he have, have recommended this illustrator to you know, to Lewis to, you know, to do that. I think not. And tellingly, his granddaughter, Tolkien's granddaughter, Joanna, recalls that the Narnia books were on the shelves at her grandparents' house for the grandkids to read when they came over. So Tolkien didn't himself enjoy them, but he thought they were good enough um, and worthwhile enough that he could recommend them to others, including to his own grandchildren. Very interesting. Yeah. Nice bit of detective work there. John, there's quite a bit of material in the exhibit related to sort of the practical logistics of putting together a work as complex uh, geographically and chronologically as The Lord of the Rings. There's a number of ways that Tolkien organized that and uh, with things like maps and timelines. So can you talk about that a bit? Tolkien was always very clear in his practice, particularly or maybe especially only so for Lord of the Rings, and stated that he began with a map and made the story fit. Middle Earth and Lord of the Rings is not a narrative that creates space. It was a physical space that had narratives within it. And so the geography is always was always first and foremost to Tolkien in the creation of Middle Earth. The story originally for Lord of the Rings was supposed to be a sequel to The Hobbit, another of Bilbo's adventures called The Magic Ring. Uh, this very quickly changed as Tolkien started writing, and it became what we know it to be. But his process was not necessarily linear. He did not have the ending planned out when he started writing. He wasn't even completely sure where the characters were going or what this story was going to become. And his process in writing was sort of one more of discovery than authorial intent, in a way. He was surprised to find Aragorn sitting in the inn at Bree. He was neither sure what Bree was nor who Aragorn was. He didn't know who Faramir was when he turned a corner 
and ran into Sam and Frodo. It's a very surprising type of composition. And I think people are, many, many readers especially, are unaware of sort of, in some ways, Tolkien, you know, is discovering the story along with the reader as he produced it. But that that being said, there are elements of sort of plan in his process. He had ideas of the Ent Treebeard early on. And so there are notes, and we have a, a page exhibition that shows this, where Frodo meets Treebeard and is surprised when he leans against a tree and the tree moves, but is is hasn't yet discovered that Treebeard is in league with Sauron. This idea, of course, is not what comes to pass. And it's Marion Pippin who meet Treebeard, who is, of course, a, a force for good rather than evil. And there are, are aspects in Tolkien's plan as, as the fellowship fractures and the narrative for Lord of the Rings gets very chronologically and geographically complex, Tolkien started creating uh, graph timelines for all the different characters and what they were doing on the same day, specific days, so that he could keep the uh, chronological veracity of the story intact. And so there are, I think, about over a dozen of these sort of charts planning out uh, the narrative so that on, you know, the same given day, he knows where Gandalf is, Merriam Pippin, Aragorn, Legolas, and Gimli, and uh, Frodo and Sam, as well as the orcs, you know, all the different characters so that particularly for important for Sam and uh, for, yeah, Sam and Frodo, when they look up and see, you know, the phase of the moon at night, it's the same one that Aragorn is looking up from Minas Tirith to see. It's that sort of that deep truth to the world that he was planning out to maintain, you know, at a, at a very, I mean, in some ways superficial, but very basic level, the complete veracity of that world. It is for him a real world. And so that kind of truth had to be maintained. The maps that he has, uh, that we have in the show and that he produced for Lord of the Rings are all done to scale. They have a grid line over them with demarcations of, you know, the squares being 100 miles square, 200 miles square to keep track even of like the actual amount of distance that any character could travel on a given day. And he states that he never made any character travel more than he physically could and tries to work out exactly how far a hobbit could travel if they are half the size of a man you know down to like the hobbit measurements of from a toenail up to a hobbit mile you know how big are these things and when he says you know that sam and frodo have to travel x amount in a day could they actually do that um the same of course goes for aragorn and legolas and gimli gandalf all the characters have to maintain that physical truth. And I don't think there's any other writer of fantasy or fiction that quite goes to that depth in maintaining the the absolute truth of their world. I think that's one of the things in which Tolkien has been often imitated, but never matched even close. Because I, I think a lot of fantasy authors have, have wanted to have the effect, but haven't been willing to put the work in to achieve it. And so you get the the sort of veneer, but it's only about a quarter of an inch thick. Whereas with with Tolkien, it goes all the way down. Yeah, I was talking to one of the guys I live with about this last night, and he said, you know, a lot of fantasy authors who have come after who have tried to do world building, you know, have only done it to the extent that maybe Lord Dunsany did it, where it, they're not really too concerned about <laughs> about the consistency of the details. They're th- they're throwing things in to be evocative, whereas Tolkien already had these things worked out and then he hints at them in Lord of the Rings without telling you everything. But he actually does have it worked out to a certain degree. Not all, not all of it. He continues to work things out in letters and, and things like that when people ask him questions. But uh, the other aspect of it, I think, is to create a world, you have to have a worldview uh, I think a, a sort of a metaphysical outlook that w- will support that world. And a lot of fantasy authors want to create a world and they're being imaginative and playful, but they don't necessarily have like a metaphysical structure that can make that world compelling. And that's one area where I think that his Catholicism, even though what he's depicting is not an explicitly Catholic world, obviously, but it's metaphysically plausible 
I guess I would say. I think that's one thing that makes it hold together so well. Well, he's very clear that everything in his world is is consistent with the way that reality is. And so as a Catholic, he would hold that Catholic doctrine teaches about this is this is what the universe is like. This is the way that it that it works, and so I think in Tolkien here, I think is following in some senses George MacDonald, who in Tolkien had read MacDonald's essays about uh, the fantastic imagination, and MacDonald's you know not a Catholic, um, he's a Christian, and he's very clear that for him, the fantasy world, the secondary world, has to follow the same moral rules, the, the same moral reality as the real world. You know, you can't say that good is evil and evil is good in your fantasy world because it's not so in reality. And Tolkien takes this this idea and he develops it, I think, even more consistently. And for instance, in an interview, an interviewer asked him, you know, is is Eru, you know, is is you know the the one, is that is that God? And Tolkien says, yes, yes, that, you know, there is one God. It's not that I have invented a God and put him in my Middle Earth. It's, you know, the God of Middle Earth is God. And so everything in Middle Earth is consistent with Catholic theology because he's, these are the sort of fundamental rules of the universe. It's like gravity, you know, this is the way it is supernaturally and metaphysically. Yeah, it's the contingent realities like angels and, you know, the different types of you know, intelligent beings that exist and the sort of the, the the manner in which the world is created, things like that, that could have been different, but they're not necessary realities. Those are the things you can play with. Exactly. Because he, he imagines, for instance, well, what if there were other intelligent races? Because that's something that there could be. I mean, for all we know that there there might be on other planets, you know, that's that's certainly a possible you know, God could have done that. And so he's imagining what if there were elves and dwarves and what if they were created differently from humans? And this, for instance, sometimes people think that the the fact that elves reincarnate, they think that this means that Tolkien really is not actually an Orthodox Catholic because reincarnation is not part of Orthodox Catholicism. Humans die and then you know, the souls, our souls are judged and there's no reincarnation. But it's really important to recognize that he's created elves. They're a different race. They're not humans. He's very clear that this isn't happening to humans. It's off stage, but it's very clear that humans have death and then that's their, their gift and their doom. And then they go off and the elves don't know where they go. Now, the elves within the created order are, you know, immortal in that in, in the created order, they, they don't die naturally, although they can be killed. And in this created order, they can reincarnate. But that just happens to be the way that Eru Iluvatar has created these beings within this created order. doesn't say anything about, you know, what's going to happen to them at the end of the world, what's going to happen to them ultimately. And it also is entirely separate from, from humans. So I think in this sense, people sometimes underrate Tolkien's theological acumen because he knows his Catholic theology well enough to know where he can be inventive. You know, he's got his creation story where he's, you know, it's a Genesis story for Middle Earth. He's expressing it through music rather than through the spoken word. So in that sense, it's different from- And the angels are assisting in creation. Right. So he's got he's got the concept, but because he knows the fundamental truth is that God created- he can play with that because the angels, the archangels, you know, the Valar in the story of Middle Earth, um, they are all created beings. They're not divine in the sense of being co-creators with Iluvatar. He has created them and then he is allowing them to assist in the affiliation of his his creation. Again, that is perfectly consistent you know, as an imaginative alternative. And so we have, and he, and he does call them at different points. He identifies that these are the angels. And, you know, what, you know, in angels, I, I think we tend sometimes to, to fall into stereotype thinking about them. Oh, they've got wings and halos and kind of stupid. But angel just means messenger. They're supernatural beings. They're non-material, created, intelligent beings who do the bidding of God, and some of whom have chosen to rebel against God and, you know, are, are allowed for the time being to, you know, to, to do that. So we have the Valar who are doing exactly the same kinds of functions as the angels do. And in that sense, here is where 
I think we start to get at some of what Tolkien means when he says that The Lord of the Rings is a fundamentally religious and Catholic work, because he's not putting angels in them in ways that we would recognize, but he's giving us these these beings who are not human, not quite human. They can take on human appearance. They can, as as the angels do in scripture, for instance, they're acting in powerful ways and we don't quite understand them, but we, you know, we know that my friends with Gandalf is he's a force for good. So nowhere does Tolkien within the story say, oh, this is an angel. But what he's doing is he's giving us imaginatively a picture of what it might be like to have other beings in our in our created order that do that kind of thing and then we can we can think well hey maybe maybe my idea about my guardian angel isn't this little trite sappy thing that i've been taking from you know hallmark cards maybe the angels really are powerful intelligent spiritual beings who are doing god's bidding and Wow, maybe maybe I've come to a better understanding of what angels really are. Uh, John, how long does this exhibit go? Uh, the exhibition is up at the Morgan Library until May twelfth. Okay, great, and I will link to the Morgan Library's website and the page for the exhibition on the show notes. Uh, Holly, when did you say you thought your book would be coming out? Well, we'll see how long um, it takes. Uh, I'm giving it over to my editors at Kent State University Press in May in just a couple months' time. And so, God willing, it will be the end of 2019 or possibly the beginning of 2020. Um, but it, it's finished, and now it just needs to get that last little touch of polishing and then hand it over to my editors. So, God willing, 2019 or early 2020. Okay. Well, when that comes back, I'll go back and add that to the show notes for this episode, and I'll I'll maybe republish it to remind people. And also, you might direct people to my website, which is hollywardway.com, okay. where I will be having updates <laughs> on the, on this. Okay, great. Well, Holly and John, thank you very much for coming on the show. Thank you. Thank you. Today's reading is an excerpt of a letter from Tolkien to Milton Waldman. Do not laugh, but once upon a time, my crest has long since fallen, I had a mind to make a body of more or less connected legend, ranging from the large and cosmogonic to the level of romantic fairy story, the larger founded on the lesser in contact with the earth, the lesser drawing splendor from the vast backcloths, which I could dedicate simply to, to England, to my country. It should possess the tone and quality that I desired, somewhat cool and clear, be redolent of our air, the clime and soil of the northwest, meaning Britain and the hither parts of Europe, not Italy or the Aegean, still less the east and while possessing, if I could achieve it, the fair elusive beauty that some call Celtic, though it is rarely found in genuine ancient Celtic things. It should be high, purged of the gross, and fit for the more adult mind of a land long now steeped in poetry. I would draw some of the great tales in fullness, and leave many only placed in the scheme and sketched. The cycles should be linked to a majestic whole, and yet leave scope for other minds and hands, wielding paint and music and drama. Absurd. Of course, such an overweening purpose did not develop all at once. The mere stories were the thing. They arose in my mind as given things, and as they came, separately, so too the links grew, an absorbing, though continually interrupted labor, especially since, even apart from the necessities of life, the mind would wing to the other pole and spend itself on the linguistics. Yet always I had the sense of recording what was already there, somewhere, not of inventing. Of course, I made up and even wrote lots of other things, especially for my children. Some escaped from the grasp of this branching, acquisitive theme, being ultimately and radically unrelated. Leaf by Niggle and Farmer Giles, for instance, the only two that have been printed. The Hobbit, which has much more essential life in it, was quite independently conceived. I did not know as I began that it belonged, but it proved to be the discovery of the completion of the whole, its mode of descent to earth and merging into history. As the high legends of the beginning are supposed to look at things through elvish minds, so the middle tale of The Hobbit takes a virtually human point of view, and the last tale blends them. 